I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today about my very favorite subject of all time, which is the female brain and how aging, hormones, and experience impact women's brain health. And I'm going to talk about sex differences, at least initially, and I'm talking about the biological differences between males and females. And I think you can see very clearly across the animal kingdom, there are large sex differences, uh, predominantly in body size, so often males are larger than females. Uh, but in some species, like uh, uh, birds, the feathers are brighter and prettier, and in fact they say that males are prettier than the females, although I'd argue that in humans and some <laughs> couples it's different. So it shouldn't be so surprising that we, because we look different that our brains are also different. And, and certainly one reason to study the female brain is that we have a different physiology. We're the ones giving birth, we're the ones that are breastfeeding and taking care of the young. And this is true pretty much across, universally across the animal kingdom. Again, it shouldn't be surprising that female brains are organized differently than male brains. And there's a lot of sex difference in brain disease. So as been mentioned already, f women are more likely to get depression and Alzheimer's disease. And this is irrespective of the fact that we live longer than men. But men, on the other hand, are more likely to get Parkinson's disease and, as boys, autism. So why study sex differences in disease? Well, that gives us clues on how that disease might develop, and there are a lot of sex differences in uh, when diseases develop, how they're manifested, the symptoms of the diseases are actually different between men and women, and treatment, and the treatment's actually been virtually ignored in the literature, the medical literature. Uh, anytime you see a sex difference, that should cue you to think that sex hormones are involved, and just so we're on the same page, I'm using my kids a lot in this presentation. Um, estrogens in women and uh, testosterone in men. And that's not to say that we don't, each sex doesn't have the other hormone, we do just at a different level. There's a lot of evidence for sex hormones to be involved in both depression and Alzheimer's disease, and these are the two disease states that I study. So in uh, women, when there are large fluctuations, and in men, when there's lower levels of testosterone, that's the time of greatest risk to develop depression. Uh, for both men and women, when there are lower levels of testosterone and estradiol and estrogens, that's the time of greatest risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. Now I'm going to be, I think it's very brave of the men in the audience to be here, I'm going to be talking about estrogens in my talk. And I want to introduce the two main players. So uh, there's two forms, estradiol, which is the more potent estrogen, which is depicted here in these black dots, and estrone, which is depicted in these white dots. And this is menopause down here. And of course, at menopause, both of these estrogens decline. But estradiol, the more youthful one, much more so than estrone. And there's actually a shift in the ratio. So this less potent estrogen is actually at higher values. Now I'm sure many of you are uh, discouraged by science because in the media we see one day hormone replacement therapy is good for learning and memory and then the next day another, another study will come out and I'll say hormone replacement therapy is bad for learning and memory. So what we do as scientists is group all these studies together to see what sort of comes out in the wash. And the way we do this is it's called a meta-analysis. And I'm going to show you the results of a meta-analysis using these two. It turns out there are many different kinds of hormone replacement therapy. Some use estrone, the weaker estrogen, and some use estradiol, the more powerful estrogen. And it turns out that matters. So this is effects on memory, and you're going to see positive effects in gray, and this is estradiol, that more potent youthful estrogen, versus estrone. And out of all of these studies, 80% of the studies see a positive effect with this youthful estrogen, but only 20% of the studies show a positive effect on memory, and you can also think of this as Alzheimer's risk, with estrone. Unfortunately, the most popular hormone replacement therapy uses estrone, so the, the very big studies are done using that estrone. Now I'm a neuroscientist, so I study the brain, and the brain area that I'm most excited by is, is the hippocampus. Why am I excited about this area? It's really important for memory. So it takes memory from short term and puts it into long term memory. It's also very plastic in adulthood, and so what I mean by that is it's very malleable, and I'm going to show you examples of that. And this is exciting because when we see brain cell loss, we want to have that plasticity, we want to boost that plasticity in order to replace those brain cells that are lost. And as you might suspect, it shrinks with both depression and an Alzheimer's disease, so it's an implicated in both. This is an illustration of a he healthy brain on one side, advanced Alzheimer's on the, uh, on the right side, and th this hole here is where the hippocampus should be. Um, and in fact, in Alzheimer's disease, the hippocampus is the first brain area to show cell loss. 
And it turns out that hormones, I wouldn't be standing here if this wasn't true, but hormones boost plasticity in the brain. So I'm going to give you some examples. Um, this is a rat brain uh, slice, and a lot of our research comes from animal studies. Uh, this is a placebo, this is estradiol, that more youthful estrogen, and hopefully you can see there's more of these little protrusions sticking out from this branch. And those protrusions are, they're called spines, and they're the ways that cells communicate with each other. So estradiol is increasing the communication between cells. Stress affects uh, primarily this area. So this is males undergoing stress, this is females undergoing stress. And hopefully what you can see is um, that the architecture of these cells changes. So in males with chronic stress, the top of the tree shrinks. But in females, it's the bottom of the tree that shrinks. And in fact, this has functional consequences for both men and women and, and animals. And I'm happy to talk about that at the end. This is my favorite area of the hippocampus. It's the dentate gyrus, and why is it my favorite? Because it has all these new brain cells that are produced throughout adulthood. So it's only been for the last 20 years that we've discovered that new brain cells can be produced um, in adulthood, and that's true across every single species out there. I don't know how well you can see this because it's so bright in this room on such a dull day. It's a gorgeous room. But this is the dentate gyrus. And probably many of you are very familiar with the term stem cell. There are stem cells that reside in this area. It's one of the only brain areas that has these stem cells. And when they decide to propagate, they form two cells. And at least one of these cells will form appropriate connections with the rest of the hippocampus. And there are many ways we can look at these cells. Um, one way is looking at the maturation of the cell. Again, you can't see this very well, but you can see the pictures of my daughter. So that's, that's the only important thing. Um, depending on the stain that we're looking at, we can see very early stages of the cell, so I call that a baby cell. And it's a very quick process, so about four days later I'm calling it a school-age cell. You can probably start to see this little process that's sticking out from that cell. And then 14 days later, and this is all in the adult brain, um, you, we, I'm going to call it a teenage cell. You can see the process is even longer here, and there's actually a few branches, and you probably can't see, but I'll show you afterwards if you're really interested. You can see those little spines, those protrusions coming up, so it's communicating with the rest of the brain. Um, it, it turns out that, yes, the number of cells probably matters, but it also matters what turns these cells on, what activates these cells. And this is a very new thing. Only in the last couple of years have we started to look at this, not just us, but all scientists. And we, we can do this in a variety of ways, but what turns on these cells is memory, and that's exciting for memory diseases. So as you might suspect, these new brain cells are involved in disease, and uh, there's, you see both an increase and a decrease in this process called neurogenesis. In depressed patients, we see a decrease in neurogenesis, and in every animal model of depression, we also see a decrease. I want to emphasize this because uh, animal models in the literature, in the media, get kind of a bum rap, that there's not good translation from animals to humans. But actually, if you look carefully enough, you do see good translation, and this is one of those areas where we see good translation. In Alzheimer's patients, perhaps paradoxically, you see an increase at the beginning. That's probably some kind of compensation. But as time goes on, there's a decrease. And animal models also show the same kind of progression. So it's been kind of exciting. Maybe we can use these new brain cells for treatment. And in fact, things that we know uh, alleviate depression or can help with Alzheimer's disease, like exercise, or at least that's what I tell myself every time I force myself to go for a run, um, or testosterone helps in depression and also Alzheimer's disease, or chronic antidepressants, those boost those new brain cells. And things that are risk factors for depression and Alzheimer's disease, like chronic stress or aging, decrease these new brain cells. Again, as most of you are well aware after all these presentations, women are virtually ignored in the literature. So one of the first things we wanted to do was to look, I'm going to tell you about, is to look at chronic antidepressants and how they affect these new brain cells and men versus women. So all the studies that have been out there already put them together, they grouped them together, and we wanted to look at them separately to see if there was a difference. So this is uh, uh, post-mortem tissue. And we're looking at these teenage brain cells, which are de depicted here. So they're not in teenage brains. They're in adult brains, but they're these young, maturing cells. And men are in black here. Here are con people without any psychiatric disease. And these are people that had depression, but were also taking antidepressants. And you can see there's no change in those two bars. 
It wasn't until we looked at women that are in the pink here, that's when we saw the big change. So there's more of these new brain cells, there's more plasticity with antidepressants in women brain versus men's brains. Now we wanted to look at hormone levels. And fortunately, not everyone donates their brain to science, so we didn't have a big enough sample size to really split it up well. But I can split it up by age. So we looked at younger than 50 and older than 50. And the, the reason we did that was because at 50, both men and women have a decline in their hormone levels, their sex hormone levels. So younger than 50, this is men and women together, so you don't see the, as great a boost, but you see this boost with antidepressants in these young teenage brain cells. But you don't see any evidence for this boost in the older brain. So I think this shows us two things. One, that the older brain is less plastic. It's got less of these cells. But the other thing is that hormones might be to blame. And so that's actually our current working hypothesis, that if we can give hormones back when the brain is less plastic, that we might be able to see more of a therapeutic effect of some of these agents. I'm going to shift gears here a tiny bit and talk about uh, pregnancy and motherhood. Now, you can't go buy a checkout stand these days without seeing, uh, you know, the current, this is a little old, the current celebrity or royalty that's pregnant, and they all look so fabulous and glamorous. And I'm going to share with you the worst picture of me ever taken in my life <laughs> <laughs> to prove to you it's not all glamorous. <laughs> So I think you can see, it's a little unfair because there's moments after giving birth to my son, but I think you can see on my face how uh, emotionally and physically draining the process was. And in fact, there's a whole area of research devoted to, to maternal adaptation, how the woman's body has to change in order to um, ensure the survival of the fetus. Uh, you know those big milk jugs, four liters of milk? That's how much water a woman retains at the end of her pregnancy, a lot of extra water. Hormone levels are increased by 200 to 300 to 1,000 times normal levels. And we're not talking for a day or two. We're talking for months and months and months at a time. So be nice to your pregnant wives. <laughs> so we were really interested. It's not so surprising that there might be repercussions, right? That's one of the big differences between men and women's brains. And in fact, there is both an increase and a decrease risk to develop div diseases after motherhood. In the short term, postpartum depression, it's a time of greatest risk to develop depression in a woman's lifetime. Obsessive compulsive di disorder is three to five times more likely after giving birth. And <laughs> the scary bit here is in longer term, there are new studies suggesting that all, you might, women might be at greater risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. Now this is very early stages of this, so don't panic. <laughs> um, but, and it seems to be mitigated by how long you breastfeed and how many boys versus girls you have. In terms of decreased risk, it's for almost all the reproductive cancers, breast, ovarian, and endometrial cancer. So we were interested in, is, does the plasticity of the brain change if you're a mom versus a non-mom? So what you see here are the number of these teenage brain cells that I showed you earlier. And non-moms, so this is in rats, these are non-moms in the bright blue and moms in the dark blue. And this is many, many months after they've had their last litters. But hopefully you can see that moms have much more plasticity in their brain than the non-moms, almost threefold increase. So what happens to memory? Well, before I describe the results, I want to tell you that there's multiple ways you can look at memory. It's not, a, it's not just one thing. And the way I'm going to do this is by using my parking garage. <laughs> so this is uh, the parking garage I parked in on campus every year for the last 17 years. It stays in the same place. It doesn't move from day to day, right? It's long-term memory. It's called reference memory, where that parking garage is. But where I park my car every day changes, right? So that's working memory. It's new information. Daily it changes where I'm parking my car. And it's not short-term memory. I'm not going in to work for 10 minutes, I wish. I'm going in for eight hours, 20 hours, and then I have to remember where I park my car at the end of the day. So that's working memory. And there are ways that we can look at this. And I have a, everybody likes a video, right? <laughs> this is the video I have. Uh, so here's a, a rat, and actually you can use humans in the same kind of design they have used it. And they have to swim, it's a circular pool filled with opaque water, and there's a hidden submerged platform in one area. And they need to use the cues around the rim to find that platform. And they do very well at it, they learn very quickly to find that hidden submerged platform. And it involves the hippocampus, that's really important because that's what I study. And this is showing you reference memory, that's, that platform is in that stable spot 
all the time for all of these trials. And we look at memory by the distance they travel to reach that platform. So this is a working memory version. So in this particular case, we're changing, these are our older, uh, these are middle-aged a rat, so we wanted to give them a slightly easier task, so we get put the, the platform in the same spot for two days, and then we move it for the next two days, and then the next two days. And what you're looking at here is distance to reach the hidden platform. This longer distances, poor memory, shorter distances, better memory. And hopefully, again, you can see fairly clearly here the moms in dark blue, non-moms in bright blue, and the moms are traveling shorter distances to reach that platform. They have better working memory than the non-moms. Now this advantage disappears. All rats eventually learn the task. It's a fairly easy task. It's just in that initial por portion. What about reference memory? So that's when that platform stays in the same spot all the time. We see much the same kind of thing. So as days progress, Everybody gets better, but the moms show an advantage over the non-moms. They have better working memory and better reference memory. Now, what about in terms of plasticity of the brain? Oh, no, not yet. Sorry, only three more data slides, and then I'm done. What we wanted to look at was, this is a, a fairly weak effect, but it's still there. What about in terms of drugs? How, uh, is the pharmacology of the brain a little different between non-moms and moms as women age? And so we chose to look at Premarin, which is that main hormone therapy that's out there right now, and it's that weaker estrogen, that estrone. And what we found, much to our surprise in a way, is that non-moms got better, but the moms got worse in terms of performance. And this is pretty profound because I'm telling you that drugs, and, and we suspect that antidepressants work very similarly, are working differently in an aging brain that's been exposed to pregnancy and motherhood compared to not. And I think this leads us into the idea that we need tailored treatment. We have the same treatment for men and women. I think that's a, probably not the right thing. And even in women with different experiences, we also probably need different treatment. Uh, in terms of plasticity in the brain, we see the same kind of thing. So this is the same thing you've seen before, moms versus non-moms. But the non-moms, when we gave them different estrogens, their plasticity went up. Their memory went up, their plasticity went up. The non in the moms, the plasticity went down. The memory went down, the plasticity went down. And now we're looking at activation of these new cells. None of this makes much difference if we can't translate it into humans. So on the last data slide I'm going to show you, we're, we're starting to work with Sherry Hayden, Dr. Sherry Hayden, who uh, runs the Alzheimer's Clinic at UBC Hospital. And we're looking at how these different hormone replacement therapies affect uh, women. Now, the first is early stages of this, but we just looked at the women with dementia and just looked at this um, memory score here. So better memory, higher scores. And it, it turns out that if you have two or more children, women with dementia actually perform better on this task than, than women without any children. And now we're looking through hospital records to see what kind of hormone, if they were taking hormone replacement therapy and if they were performing differently. So in conclusion, I think it's really important to understand the basic and disease mechanisms in both males and females, but also in females with different kinds of experience. It's naive of us to think that it's a one-size-fits-all, that we need some kind of tailored medical treatment, and it's time to wise up to the fact. <laughs> uh, and obviously, it takes a village. It's not just me that does this work, but a lot of really bright, brilliant minds. Uh, you can see <laughs> I forgot to Photoshop out the martini I'm holding there. <laughs> but sometimes that stimulates ideas. Um, and uh, funding agencies past and present that have given us work, but it's, uh, we're really excited to continue work in this area and to continue these bright minds so that they're also interested in women's brain health. Thank you very much.